When it comes to preaching and teaching, I have two real passions. One of them is the Word of God. I love the Word of God. I love to open it. I love, one of my favorite things is when you're going through something and then you can see the light bulb click in someone's head like, oh, I get it. I get what this is about. So it's one of my very favorite things. Obviously, if you don't love the Word of God, it would be a very difficult thing to be a preacher, although there are them, and, and you, you, I, you hear them on the radio and, and on TV and on the internet every week by week by week. Uh, but the second thing I'm very, very passionate about, and it, it, that's church history. I love, love, love church history. And I, what I love to do once a year is combine those two passions into one series. And so that's what we're doing. Last year, if you remember, if you were joining us uh, on Wednesday nights, we talked about the Puritans. We went through the lives of, of several of the Puritans. And so this year I want to talk about the Reformers. We're moving backward in history, uh, but I, I want to touch on the Reformers this year, especially since this is uh, Reformation Month. And I know that everybody kind of looks at October and says that's, that's Halloween, that's the, the big holiday, but before Halloween, well actually it was after Halloween was a, was a, a holiday, Martin Luther in 1517 nailed the 95 Theses, 95 Objections to the Catholic Church on the door of the Church of All Saints Church in Wittenberg and kick-started what we call the, Re uh, the Reformation, although I am looking at this a lot earlier than, than 1517 in that. Uh, I went to a, just by way of kind of some introduction to uh, my journey with uh, church history, I went to a very, very conservative, independent, fundamental Baptist college. Okay, so that meant I had to wear a tie every day to school, and we couldn't go to the movies. That was, those were the two big things. Uh, my last year there, they opened it up where you could go to the movies. But by that point, it was like nobody wanted to go because it wasn't, you know, it wasn't secret anymore. You didn't have to hide it, and so nobody really went. But one of the things at this college that I went to, I love the education I received there, but one of the things that they don't do is they have almost no emphasis on church history. And maybe that's changed since the time that I've been there, but I, we didn't really read anybody outside of the 20th century for the entire time that I was in, in seminary. And so I got out of seminary, and I, I went into ministry, and I began to read some of the, the big figures in church history. I began to read Augustine and Calvin and John Owen and Robert Murray Machane. I started to read these big figures, and I, I, I was a little bit hurt. I, I a little bit looked back at my education, and I said, how did you ignore Spurgeon? How did you ignore some of these, these big figures in church history? And I began to read them, and I realized what a treasure that we have in church history. And for most people in the church, we're going to be honest, most people in most churches don't have much knowledge of church history, and sadly on the other side, don't have much desire to know about church history. I know for, for my kind of upbringing, it was basically, hey, if it didn't happen recently, what was, the, what was the point of it? And now that I look back, you see when you read through and you look through church history, you see a tapestry of God's providence and God's grace for his church from beginning to end. It's a beautiful picture. The modern church desperately needs the lessons that church history teaches us. So tonight, all I want to do is give us an idea of what the Reformation is, where did it happen in history, and why. What caused Reformation? And so we're gonna, next week we're going to start talking about the actual Reformers themselves. We're going to start with a man named John Wycliffe, and uh, just he's, he's the best way to start. I've been studying his life, um, learning new things about it, and, and I'm really excited about that. But let's talk, about, let's talk about church history in general. So we can divide church history typically into seven parts. This is unique to me. I know there's a lot of different ways that you can divide church history, but I like to divide it into seven different pieces. Um, these aren't equal pieces. They are different um, ones. So the first one is this, the apostolic age. You could also call this the early church. This was the period from Christ's uh, ascension into heaven to the death of the last apostle. And so around about, about 100 A.D. We think John probably died in 95 <coughs> A.D., but um, I, I like to try to give some round numbers. So this is the apostolic age. This is when the apostles actually lived. So the ones who walked with Jesus, Peter, James, and John, and Paul. And, and, and so we see that it started officially at Pentecost. When, when the church officially, when we call this the church age, officially began. But this was the time of the apostles. We actually get to read about that in, in Scripture. That's what's recorded in Scripture. With the death of John, that's the last, that's the last of the, the apostolic age. And so from there we enter into a new age called the church fathers. 
We can argue a lot about when this age starts and when this age ends, but I like to look at it uh, from about 100 to about 800 AD. The first of our church fathers, I have it out of order here, the first of our church fathers was a man named Polycarp. Polycarp was the disciple of John. So John himself taught and discipled uh, this man Polycarp. And so it ends with a, a man named John of Damascus. This was the time when the church solidified. This is probably, out of all the time periods, the most crucial. Because this is where Christianity was either going to make it or, or be broken. And obviously we know in God's sovereignty, it wasn't going to break. God said, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. But as you look at the, the church father age, this was the time when they collected the writings of the apostles. They put it together in canon. They solidified doctrine. They wrote the church creeds. We, we looked at uh, one of them this morning. So this was such an important time for the church. You've probably heard me mention people like Polycarp or, or Tertullian or Augustine. Uh, they, they were, we call them our church fathers. They, they were the, the fathers of doctrine. They were the ones who were the first ones to write down what they believed and, and why. And, and so that's, uh, this, is, this was a great time for the church. Then we enter into a not-so-great time for the church. The medieval church really, really, really <coughs> struggled. Uh, this is probably the darkest period in church history, the, the medieval church. A lot of false doctrine came out of this time period. The Catholic church became one colossal, unstoppable entity. Before that, there were many churches scattered around, but there was really no cohesion between them. We had bishops over certain areas, certain cities, but now during this medieval time we see the church become unified, which sounds like a good thing, but it becomes a, a, a swollen carcass. It, it becomes this, this big mass that is impossible to keep pure, is, is the idea behind it. It's this time also that the church became intertwined with the kingdoms of the world, and the Catholic Church became a political entity versus a religious group and so that's that, that you're going to see that play into a big part in the reformation because the reformation didn't just affect the church it affected nations nations went to war with one another over the things that are going to happen in the reformation pope urban the second i put him on the list he is a notable figure in the most negative way possible he was the first pope to declare a crusade and he was the first one to say if you die in service to this crusade you will go to heaven guaranteed and so that's how he got many many thousands of Christians to sign up to go fight in the crusade uh, to retake Jerusalem because he promised them heaven hey, I don't have to do anything ever I just got to go fight and I'll go to heaven so that's a negative thing the doctrine of purgatory was developed during this time the doctrine of the infallibility of the Pope so I don't know if you know this, but Catholics believe, to this day, believe that the Pope is sinless. They believe he has no sin, that he, is, that he was born sinless, that he is the mouthpiece of God, that when he speaks, he speaks with the authority of God himself. That was all solidified during this time period of the medieval church. Um, that doesn't mean, I, 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 I harp on this because we're going to kind of dwell on this a little bit, that doesn't mean there weren't true Christians during this time. They're very, very much were true Christians during this time. You read the writings of Thomas of Becket, Francis of Assisi, and then of uh, Thomas Aquinas as well. You read these writings, and it's obvious that there are real Christians who were really being led by the Lord and, and being saved and, and, and working through the church. So they may have been a very, very, very small remnant. But for the most part during this time, the people in, in, within the Catholic Church became very culturally Christian, and that's, we still see the holdovers of it today. I grew up in a Catholic country, Bolivia is about 90% Catholic, but the people there, they don't attend Mass, they don't go to church, they are baptized in a church, uh, they're married in a church, and they're buried in a church, that, that, that's it, they don't, they don't live out what they believe at all, and that all started here in the medieval church. And so from there, that's where we come to where we're going to study, and that's the Reformation. The Reformation happened roughly 1300 to 1600. We're going to look more specifically about a 250 year period of time. But uh, the Reformation happened as a result of what was going on in, in the medieval church. Courageous men challenged the teachings and the authority of the Catholic Church. And they started a movement that was protesting 
the church. That's why today we're called Protestants, because we're still in protest. The Catholic Church to this day considers us apostate. They look at Protestants and they say that we are, we are not saved, that we are not part of the body of Christ until we come back into the church. And there is a lot of belief that one day they will gather all Christians back together under one, under one banner. I, I, I mean, a true Christian, I don't see how they could ever go back to a system of works-based salvation and of revering and praying and interceding saints instead of going to Christ himself. One of my favorite moments, Tom and I just talked about this the other day, is during the pandemic, uh, the Pope came out and said, because of COVID, you don't need to go to a priest in order to receive confession and, and absolution. You can go straight to God now. And we were all like, what? We can go straight to God now? What an amazing thing. Literally, that is one of the things that Martin Luther nailed to the door of the church. We do not need another intercessor. We have Christ himself as our one and only mediator. So I thought that was so funny. That it was like a novel thing. You can do that now. What? I can do that now? It's amazing. Um, and all Protestants are saying, we've been, we've been doing that for, you know, 500 years, 517 years. Uh, a lot of the reformers are here. We're not going to be able to touch on every reformer. There are hundreds of them that influence pockets of uh, little communities of faith across Europe and across the world. Uh, but we're going to touch on uh, some of the major figures, but you can see some of them here. John Wycliffe, Jan Hus, Martin Luther, Philip Melanchthon, uh, John Calvin, John Knox. We're going to talk about some of these men. <coughs> the Reformation continued in another age uh, we call the Puritans. The Puritans were the heirs of the Reformation. They continued the work of the reformers in the Church of England. And we owe, specifically, we owe today the, the Puritans because they're the ones that came to America and brought Christianity, real Christianity, with them uh, into, into the colony. So the Puritans, we talked about that them last uh, year. Big period of church history, about 200 years. I call them the Great Awakenings. We can mix this into or split this into several different pieces. Uh, but this is... a just a fantastic time for the, the history of the church. This is when the church grew by leaps and bounds. We have some of the most famous preachers of all time, like George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, Charles Spurgeon, D.L. Moody. This was the age of missionaries. The great missionary movement started, and missionaries went out from England and Scotland to the ends of the earth. That's men like David Livingston came out of this age as, as a fantastic time. This was when America was born during this time and very firmly rooted in the tradition of the Puritans and then in, into uh, the Great Awakenings as well. And then the last period we exist in today, the modern church. For the most part, in the last hundred years, uh, some, some, fantastic, some of the best preachers who have ever lived have lived within our lifetime, within the last hundred years. Men like Billy Graham saw, were able to preach to so many countless millions of people in a way that nobody else in this list ever could. We also saw men like Billy Sunday. Uh, we, we, saw, uh, we see some of the, the, the greatest theologians, Francis Schaeffer. Uh, we get to see uh, men like Martin Lloyd-Jones, who is the, the world, was the world's foremost authority on the book of Romans. He preached 300-some sermons on the book of Romans. Uh, have his whole commentary said it's fantastic. But this is where we are now. Unfortunately, the 21st century church uh, hasn't impressed me real, real much at all. It's, it's been uh, kind of a, an interesting mix of, of different doctrines and different things. I, I really believe the advent of technology um, in some ways has helped the church. More people are hearing the gospel than ever before. I heard on Easter Sunday of 2020, you know, when most churches were shut down, that more people heard the gospel that day on one day than any other single day in human history. So it, we see some good, but then the negative is that it is almost impossible to discern true from false teaching. It is everywhere. I, this morning, this morning I talked about some teachers and I had some people come and question, why is this person considered a false teacher? Why would you say, like, what would you say about them? And we, have to, we had to kind of go through. It, it's getting harder and harder to discern what is a false teacher. And the thing is, you, you, you read some people or you watch some things and you look and you say, well, 90% of what they say is good. Can I listen to them if 90% if is good? Well, Jesus said, a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. It, 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 a little bit of false doctrine, it, it's, and it's like, would you drink a, a bottle of water if you knew there was just one drop of poison? 
Just just one. It's not it's not going to kill. Most likely won't kill you. Just make you real sick. Would you be willing to do it? The rest of the water is good. There's a million other drops. They're fine. And we treat it like that. But the modern church has been an interesting thing. But I want you to see this. There's a pattern and a cycle that gets repeated in church history. Over and over and over and over. And you'll see it in your notes. And we're going to see it here. This is the cycle of church history. The church thrives. The church gets complacent. The church experiences reformation. And then it thrives. And we see this over and over and over again. Under the church fathers, the church thrived and grew. And then under the medieval church, they got very, very complacent. That complacency led to a need for reformation. Same thing happened. The, the church got reformed. And the church spread and grew. And, and it was fantastic. And then the Church of England became highly political. And it got complacent. And the Puritans had to come and reform. We see the same thing with the Great Awakenings. We see it again. I believe right now we're here. I believe we exi we're existing, our modern church is existing in a, in a complacent place. I, I believe and I pray for <coughs> reformation. I think that's what is on the horizon. I, I believe that it's possible. Uh, but it takes a couple of things, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Let's talk specifically, though, about the reformation. I told you I'm going to move fast. We got a lot. I probably have three weeks worth of stuff to talk about in one week tonight. So uh, let's let's move through this. Here is a more a more specific timeline. This stuff is just for context, but these are the six men that we want to talk about. I like to look at the Reformation from 1320, the birth of John Wycliffe, to 1572, the death of John Knox. So that's 252 years of, of church history. This is an amazing piece of of time. When you look at this time frame, there is so much happening. England and France begin their wars that they would fight. Well, they've been at war for a while, but they would, they would start the War of the Roses, which would last for, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of years. We also see during this time, 1492, what happened? We're celebrating it on Monday. Columbus sailed the ocean blue. So this time, during this uh, period of time, right before 1500, we see the new world is discovered. Although, if you are a student of history, you know Leif Erikson discovered uh, North America long before that. Uh, with the Black Plague swept through Europe, killed a quarter of the population. Uh, we see the Catholic Church is in disarray. They moved the, the Vatican, they moved from Rome uh, into France for a little while. And for one... A couple of year season, there were actually three people who claimed to be popes. So it's kind of an interesting time period. The church itself didn't know what was going on. There was so much division. And out of that rose these six men um, that, that we're going to look at. John Wycliffe, Jan Hus, Peter Chelchitsky. Now, he's not a very familiar name, but he is the, the reformer that would begin a movement called the Brethren, uh, which would encompass the Anabaptists which would eventually become our, our Baptist church. So we exist because, specifically because of Peter Chelchitsky. Uh, very little is known about him, but we're going to talk to him. Martin Luther, obviously the most well-known of all the reformers. Um, John Calvin and John Knox. We're going to talk about these six men. Uh, so this is kind of the time period specifically that we want to, we want to deal with. Without these men, I, I can't state this more seriously than this. Without these men we would not be meeting in this room today. We would not be a church today without these six men and others like them who bravely stood on the truth of the gospel, reclaimed the gospel, and stood on the sufficiency of scripture and challenged the church. This was a death sentence for them. Many of them would be imprisoned. Some of them would be put to death because of what they did. But now, I don't think we will ever know the debt that we owe men like this uh, for, for giving us the church that we have today. I mean, Luther, to stand against the church, what he did, and then he was, he was brought before a, a, a tribunal. They were going to excommunicate him, probably execute him, and he was in hiding for the rest of his life. And so the, these, these men are the reason why uh, we, we are here today. So I keep moving. During the time period of the medieval church, Christianity really suffered. Outwardly, the church was growing. Uh, but if, you, if you're a student of, script, or a student of history, uh, how, how did the Catholic Church typically <coughs> spread to new places? I, I, that's, a, that's a vague question, I guess. Reforce? Yes, that, that's, that's, exactly, that's exactly what happened. So missionaries with armies behind them would reach new places, and they, had, they would give you an option. It was a great option, Mary. It was convert or die. 
And so, faced with that choice, what did most of the world do? They converted. So, for example, in Bolivia, uh, it, it was converted by the Spaniards in, in uh, the 14, late 14, or actually early 15s through the 1600s. And it became just a cultural thing. They came in, they took over, they said, the gods that you worship now, you can still continue to worship them, but we're just going to rename them. So instead of worshiping Pachamama, which is Mother Earth, is one of the gods that they worshipped, now you worship Mary. She's the Queen of Heaven, and you get to call her Mary, but it's the same God. Uh, and so they renamed the saints, that, and that's just the way that it is. It, it's a very, very synergistic, very convoluted religion now it, when they, when they, um, they had a, a big cathedral that they dedicated and, and inaugurated in Bolivia, and they sacrificed a llama to the the gods of the earth in this one. And so you're thinking, you're like, I don't remember that part of the Bible. Like, I, I mean, I saw a sacrifice, but for a New Testament church, I, I'm pretty sure that we read in the book of Hebrews that Christ was the last sacrifice needed ever. So you see a, a church that was spreading rapidly, but through force. That, that's, that's how, and it was a political thing. It wasn't necessarily a, a religious thing. They wanted taxes. So they would come into places like Bolivia, loot the countries, take the silver, take the gold, take slaves, and, uh, and grow in, in that way. And you see it today. Catholics today will claim a billion adherents. I mean, that's, that's an unbelievable amount of people. And I, I always have struggled with the idea how many of those are, are real, true, born-again believers. I'm not saying that you can't be saved inside the Catholic Church. I definitely think you can. But we're saved, people are saved in spite of the teachings of the church, not because of them. And my hope and prayer for them would be that they would leave a system like that and, and go into a church that stands on these things. But so, during this time period, there was a huge divide between the people and the clergy. This was, this was one of the things that contributed toward the need for reformation. Look at the differences in this time period between the people and the clergy. The people were bitterly poor. I mean, bitterly, bitterly poor. But the clergy were immensely wealthy. It was a big divide. That right there would have been probably enough for the, the people to say, enough of this. I'm not, I'm not going to keep allowing this. Our family is starving to death. We're subsisting on almost nothing. And the clergy is doing almost nothing, and yet uh, they're, they're immensely wealthy. The people were generationally landless. It, it wasn't like it is today. We see today this ability to kind of rise up in society. You see people who uh, become our, our presidents who started as like the poorest of the poor. And you could not see that during this time. It was almost impossible to rise out of your station. If you were landless, if, you're, if you didn't inherit anything, most likely you would die landless. And you would give nothing to your kids as well. And that was the cycle repeated over and over. But the clergy became substantial landowners. The biggest landowners in England during the time of the Reformation was the church. I mean, they, they owned half of the, the nation, the, the, the island of uh, the, the British Isles. And so there was just this big divide. The people were prohibitively uneducated. They were completely illiterate. They, 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 they were just, they, had, they didn't have the luxury of education because they worked from the time they were children all the way up in, until they died. So they, they were denied a lot of the rights and a lot of the ability to change their situation but the problem is the clergy were advantageously educated. Education is power. Knowledge is power. They could read. They could read the Bible. We're going to talk about that next week. They read the Bible in a language that nobody spoke but them. And so when nobody could speak it, and I'm the clergy, and I say the Bible says this, what do you say if you don't, know what it, if you don't speak the language? I say, okay, you must be right. And what a scary time. I mean, uh, they were advantageously educated. They had all the advantages of, of what education could provide. Now, there are some, like John Wycliffe, he grew up in a, in a wealthier home. And so he was educated, and I think that changed the trajectory of his life. The people were excessively, basically, I, I, I looked up every ad, adverb that I could find. That was, that was my fun task this week. Excessively superstitious. I mean, this is the time period, well, leading up to the end of this, when we burnt women at the stake because we said they might be witches. 
uh, this, that, that's what lead, leads up to this time. Excessively superstitious. When the Black Plague swept through Europe, they, they fully viewed it as divine retribution. This is the wrath of God. And so they looked at this, like, and they were so superstitious about everything. Some of the superstitions that we hold today as a society, give me some, give me some of the things that people say are bad luck. Black cats. Yeah, black cats. Breaking a mirror. Breaking a mirror. Yeah, the number 13. All of these came out of this time period. The people didn't know. They weren't educated. They didn't know. Everything was spiritual. Everything was supernatural. They didn't understand much at this point. We hadn't really developed much of what we consider like modern science today, and so they didn't understand. They were so superstitious, and the clergy manipulated them. They were shamefully manipulative. They were so afraid that their, their family members were going to die and go to hell. And so the Catholic Church invented uh, doctrines around that, and they'd say, if you pay us this indulgence, we will give you. If you pay us an amount of money, I'll, we'll, we will... The church and the Pope himself will pray your family out of hell, out of purgatory, into heaven. They, were, they manipulated the people's superstitious nature. Um, and the, the, they were impotently voiceless. They didn't have much of a say. England was one of the first that had a house of commons. A, a group in, in, in their, the actual structure of their government where common people who were not landowners could stand in government and and voice and opinion, but for most people, you had no voice. The king said something, and you did what the king said. Uh, that's, that's why France had such violent upheavals and, and uh, revolutions, because they were tired of their rulers just having complete control. But the, the clergy, on the other hand, were unquestioningly authoritative. Whatever the clergy said went. And that was a scary, scary thing, especially politically. We're going to see John Wycliffe next week. He gets taken to prison and put on trial over and over and over in his life because the clergy or the pope said, you're a heretic. And, and he was taken to, I mean, civil court over a religious matter. I think it's pretty crazy. They were increasingly discontent. That's the key word. The medieval, the common person in medieval Christianity, they were discontent. And that fueled the fires of Reformation. By the time of the Reformers, Christianity was a powder keg. They knew that something was going to have to happen. And so we see all of, these, uh, all of these things. I spent way too much time. Let's keep going. Ingredients for Reformation. These are the things that happened, and these are the things that need to happen today in, in the same way. The first thing that we see, this is what contributed toward Reformation. Courageous dissenters. This is... This is something, it's one thing we talked about, I think, in Sunday school this morning. Uh, I was an adult, too. We talked about standing up for what you believe, standing on truth, even if it's unpopular, even if it's something that's going to cost you. These men, though, when you read their stories, it wasn't like standing up and saying, you know, I, I, I stand against abortion. I mean, I, it, there, there's a sense of that, although we're expected to. But these, these men stood up in the face of the most powerful organization on earth, and they challenged them. I mean, this, this was a death sentence. This, this is absolute fearlessness in the face of it. This is what's needed. If you have all these other ingredients, but you're missing courageous dissenters, missing people willing to stand up against the authority, then it's not going to work. So that's the first step we need. Also, the support of the people. This was, this was huge. They work in tandem. The reason why these men were able to do what they did was because the people were discontent. The people were unhappy, and they were uh, exasperated by what Rome was doing. These men were standing up against the largest, wealthiest, most influential, most powerful entity in the entire world. The church, at this point, commanded armies. The largest standing army on earth was the army of the Pope in, in Rome. And he could call up armies from every nation. He could call his banners up and men from every nation would have to come uh, to, uh, to fight for him. But the, by the time of the Reformation, the people were sick of it. The people were sick of the abuses in the church. Without the support of the people, this would have fizzled out pretty quick. But when brave men are willing to stand up and the crowds are willing to follow them, 
it makes a big difference. The fires of Reformation spread, and they spread not globally, they spread town by town. That's what's so neat about this. You see Martin Luther, when he stands up to the church, he goes on the run, and town by town, they hide him. And it's just this amazing kind of underground railroad almost as he makes his way through Germany, and, and people uh, keep him safe throughout it. This is the next thing that we need, and we're going to talk a little politically here. Freedom of debate. Freedom of <coughs> debate. This is a product of this time period, and this was absolutely necessary for the Reformation to happen. The church held sway over all information. They, every university was held in, in the grip of the church. They didn't welcome dissent. But Europe, as they moved out of the Dark Ages, began to question some of these things. Uh, and negatively, this is where humanism was born, and this is where we start to see the, the, the seeds of the Enlightenment, where people started to think maybe there's more beyond God, maybe there's more beyond knowledge, maybe science is the key. And so negatively it, it did impact, but it made people willing to have dissenting opinions. Uh, and, and now to this day, I talked about this in church a few weeks ago, you open up the comment section in Facebook and you can see what has become of our ability to debate. But that's also being attacked right now. If you have a dissenting opinion in America right now, you get canceled really, really quickly. Well, they just started this last week. If you dissent or protest in a school board meeting, the FBI is going to investigate. I saw that. Yeah. So, <clears throat> stuff like that is, is a danger to Reformation. But during this time, universities like Oxford University started sometime in the 1200s, and they encouraged Debate. They encouraged people to, uh, to, to have differing opinions, and that free exchange of ideas gave rise to men who could stand up. This one, too. Walk with me here. This, uh, this sounds big, but it's not. Sociopolitical unity. Before, during the Dark Ages in Europe, basically what you saw was little pockets of tribes. They lived isolated from other people. They spoke different languages. Uh, they, there was no unity. But what happened during this time period, as, as imperialism began, uh, nations began to grow, people began to speak the same language, people began to have the same heritage, uh, we, we see uh, kind of a spread of commerce. And all of those things created an environment where the true gospel could spread. Because now you didn't have to translate Luther's works into a thousand different dialects, you could translate into one dialect and a million people spoke that language. And so Europe became more centralized and controlled by just a few powerful nations and this allowed ideas to spread. And that leads to this, ability to distribute information. Before Gutenberg and his printing press, everything had to be either block set, so they had to, they had to uh, I mean, copy everything with a big block setter. It was faster just to write it. But after Gutenberg and his printing press, now information could be rapidly, well, I say rapidly, it took like four days to produce a single Bible. So it wasn't really rapid, but it was a lot faster than before. If you had to handwrite a copy of God's Word, that might take a year or more to do it accurately. But we, they were able to produce stuff. Pamphlets became a, a crucial part of this, both in the Reformation and in the American Revolution. Uh, men like Benjamin Franklin, he, he, he would write his Federalist Papers, and they would spread because he was able to, to copy and distribute them so fast, and that, that was a bigger, a, a bigger piece of this. And then ultimately, divine timing. This, this all came to a head because God orchestrated these events. And so we, we're going we're gonna to give him, obviously, all the credit for, for this. Uh, let's keep moving. Main issues for the Reformers. Um, they're, they're in alphabetical order. I, I didn't know what order to put them in. These are the things that the Reformers, for the most part, attacked. The abuse of power in the church. The authority of the Pope. This was one that specifically, every one of the six men that we're going to study, spoke out against the authority of the Pope. Because at this point, nobody questioned him. What he said was considered dogma, where it's not scripture, but it is church <clears throat> teaching, like what he speaks. And, I, and to this day, they believe this, and that it, it just... It, I, I can't wrap my mind around this idea that what about the popes that disagreed with one another? So which one, which one, I mean, because we're going to, we see a pope right now is probably the most liberal uh, and, and progressive pope that we've ever seen. And he's, I mean, he is allowing now uh, divorced people to take communion, which was never uh, a, an option in, inside the Catholic Church. I know that he's pushing and moving toward 
uh, a homosexual being able to take communion, which again is, is, is unheard of, uh, pushing toward abortion access, when that, the Catholics have probably stood stronger on abortion than any other uh, organization. So, so why, is, why are his words dogma and truth when popes throughout the ages have not, uh, or they were too, but now they're dissenting. It's, it's, it's a mess. And so Catholics, I, I pray during this time, would see those inconsistencies and say, there's, there's something missing here. The, the, the abuse of the church is still continuing to this day. Church tradition so we stand on one pillar as a church, as Protestants. We stand on the pillar of Scripture itself. The Scripture is sufficient. They fought in the Reformation for sola scriptura, which is Scripture alone. We believe that that is the, the, the ultimate guide of our faith and practice. The, the, church stands, the Catholic Church stands on what they call a three-legged stool. So Scripture is one of the legs. The words of the Pope, the dogma of the Pope is another leg, and church tradition is another all are equal in, in how they look at, at their faith and practice. So uh, the reformers stood up against that. Corruption in Rome. There's good evidence that many of the, the high-level bishops and cardinals throughout this time period weren't even really believers. They, they were just, this, this was political. This, this was all just a, a political situation. Greed and wealth of the clergy. Justification by faith alone. Martin Luther stood so strong on this. He said, you don't receive salvation by the teachings of the church, or by the tradition, or by the mass, or by these things, you're justified in the sight of God by faith alone. And he, he came to that conclusion by reading the book of Romans. We're going to talk about it, his moment of conversion in, in when we study him. Uh, the selling of indulgences. This is, the, the, this is the, the craziest thing in the history of our church. That you could pay money for someone to get out of purgatory and go into heaven. I mean, this is, it was such an abuse of, of poor, superstitious people. Uh, it's, that was Catholic. That yes. was Catholic. Yes. And, and so the main issue, so they were fighting against that. Uh, Martin Luther specifically, many of his 95 theses were specifically uh, fighting against the selling of indulgences. The same thing, we don't see this, but the same thing is happening today in the church. In the charismatic church, where people pay for healing, where people pay faith healers, it, to to uh, take away diseases and do this. Pay to be an apostle. Yeah, yeah. Oh, in the, yeah, in the same way. Yeah, pay to be an apostle. You go through the the, the Bethel Church's uh, apostle school, and then once you go through it and pay all the fees, and then they'll they'll pour the anointing out on you. It's the same. It's the same thing. It's the same. It's the same kind of abuse that we're seeing today. Uh, the sufficiency of Scripture. They stood on that principle, and then transubstantiation. This is one um, that still is a, a big deal today. Uh, so this is the way that you look at communion. Uh, so uh, uh, the Catholic Church believes that the, 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 the wine and the, and the bread become the actual physical body of Christ. That it, it becomes his flesh and his blood. Well, the Reformers said this is not, it's symbolic. Um, because if that was the case, then he would have to have been sacrificed weekly, over and over and over and over. We do this in remembrance. Although I will say this, some of the Reformers weren't so strong on this. Martin Luther was one of them. And so we will, we'll, we'll talk about uh, that. But uh, John Knox looked at the Queen of England and told her, I mean, straight to her face that she was wrong about transubstantiation in the Mass. So uh, some brave men uh, did these uh, things. Those are the main issues for the Reformers. Okay. That's all history. Uh, that's as, as quick as I can go to kind of encapsulate it in, into one thing. Europe was a powder keg. They were ready to explode. They needed some brave men to stand up and do something. And that's what we see with the men that we, that we see here. We can't meet together as a church and study this, though, without opening scripture. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I enjoy history, but there's something way more important than history, and that's God's word. So if you would take your copy of God's word and go to 2 Kings chapter 22. There's a story in scripture that I want to walk through as we go through this a series on the reformers, and it's the story of Reformation in the Old Testament. There's a king named Josiah who finds himself in a very similar position to the reformers, and he boldly, faithfully, and intentionally brings reform to God's people. So we're going to look at, over the next however long the series is going to take, uh, we're going to look at 2 Kings 22 and 23, but we're going to do it in, in bite-sized pieces. So this afternoon I just want to read verses 1 through 7. Everybody there? Second Kings. It's not a 
not a common book to study through, but uh, such great, great stories. All right, this is what it says, Second um, Kings 22, verse 1. Josiah was how old when he became king? Eight years old. Eight years old. I, I skipped by that many times in my readings this week, and just really today sat down and started praying through and thinking through what that means for a nation to look and have an eight-year-old king. Okay. He was eight years old when he became king. He ruled 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidah, the daughter of Adiah. She was from Boscath. He did what was right in the Lord's sight and walked in all the ways of his ancestor David. He did not turn <coughs> to the right or to the left. That's not talking politically. That's talking spiritually. Okay? He wasn't a, a libertarian. He wasn't a centrist. He was... He, this is talking spiritually. He didn't leave the path of God's word, is the, the point. In the 18th year of King Josiah, the king sent the court secretary Shaphan, son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, to the Lord's temple, saying, Go up to the high priest Hilkiah, so that he may total up the silver that was brought into the Lord's temple, the silver the doorkeepers have collected from the people. It is to be given to those doing the work, those who oversee the Lord's temple. They, in turn, are to give it to the workmen in the Lord's temple to repair the damage. They are to give it to the carpenters, the builders, the masons, to buy timber and quarried stone to repair the temple. But no accounting is to be required from them for the silver given to them since they work with integrity. All right, let's talk through this uh, really quickly. I've I got a few minutes and I want to <clears throat> look through this. Josiah became king at what age? Eight, Eight years old. Uh, believe it or not, he is not the youngest king that Israel or Judah saw. Anybody want to wager a guess as to who might have been the youngest? Does it I, start with a J? It does start with a J. Yeah, but I can't have... I, I didn't know. I'll say this. I absolutely did not know the answer to this yeah. until I studied it. So Joash oh, was seven when he became king. I, I don't know about you, seven or eight seems very young to take over the, the ruling of a kingdom. Um, but we're going to see during the life of John Wycliffe, a nine-year-old became king over England. Uh, it was different, though, because he had a, a council of protectors and, and rulers who, who ruled with him. But eight is pretty young to rule a kingdom. I have an eight-year-old girl. And uh, she, knows <laughs> uh, she can't even rule the mess in her room. <laughs> I, I, I love her dearly, but she's not fit to rule a kingdom. <laughs> but here's the thing. God gave special grace to this boy. He, he among all the rulers, uh, there was, uh, we see, just an absolute love for the Lord. It says uh, in verse 2, he did what was right. He did what was right in the Lord's sight. And we learn a lot from context here. We look at an 8-year-old boy and we say, you're not qualified. You're too young. You can't, you can't rule. You can't do this. But yet, he did what was right in the Lord's sight. But his father was a man named Ammon. Ammon was 22 when he ascended to the throne. That sounds like a more reasonable age to ascend to a throne, although I've seen some 22-year-olds who probably still couldn't rule well. But that's, that's a lot wiser, that's a lot more qualified. But 2 Kings 21.20 said Ammon did what was evil in the Lord's sight. And in fact, he only ruled for two years before his own servants conspired to murder him. So you look at this in the economy of God's kingdom, Age really doesn't factor in much. You see a, a man, a little boy like Josiah can bring reformation, but you also see a man like Martin Luther was 34 when, when he publicly stood up against the church. So age isn't necessarily a factor. What God is looking for is not qualified people. What God is looking for is willing, humble, and submitted people. The religious landscape in Judah when <laughs> Josiah took over, it was very bleak. I think it's a very similar situation to what the reformers stepped into. The people were idolatrous. They were uh, worshiping pagan gods. There was idols in the temple itself that they were worshiping. They had lived under wicked rulers for 60 years now. The temple was in absolute disrepair. Uh, there was no sacrifices happening during this time. And here's the, the clincher for this. No living person had ever heard a single word from the law. When Josiah took the throne, no living person had ever heard one single one of God's words. And that's going to be what Josiah uses to bring, uh, to bring reformation. He did what was right in the Lord's sight, and he walked in the ways of his ancestors, David. He did not 
the ancestor David, he did not turn to the right or to the left. In verses 3 through 7, I know that was kind of a strange section there, but it's just talking about him uh, ordering temple repairs. He, he says, go to the temple. Carpenters, stonemasons, go to the temple. Begin to repair the temple. That's going to be the catalyst for reformation because he's going to find something in the temple that he didn't know existed. He's going to find a copy of the law. And when he reads it, it's going to change everything for him. It's a really, really unique story. We'll continue it next week. But what marks him in this, why did he want to repair the temple? What was, what was special about it? If nobody cared about it, if it had fallen into disrepair, what caused this young boy to desire, to, by this time he was 18, to do this? Well, they, they, he had some advisors. He had some good advisors. Yes, yes. that's a big part of it. Yes, his mother, a, a, a big part of it. He knew from the history of his people that the temple was where God <clears throat> met his people. So the temple in disrepair to him stood for God's not meeting with us. God is, is, is not present in our lives. He had a heart for the, the God that his ancestors worshipped. He wanted the temple repaired and restored so his people could worship. And he put his money where his mouth was. It's, it's easy to say, I want things to change, when you're not willing to give toward it. And Josiah looks and says, no, look, at give, take all the silver. Doorkeepers start collecting silver funnel it into the work. And in fact, he didn't even ask for receipts. I don't think this is fiscally real responsible. But he, 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 did, he said, I trust these guys. These guys are working with integrity. And, and really, it's a reflection of his heart and his leadership. But he cared about God's house and God's people. And that's what's going to mark the reformers as well. These men did not want to see the Catholic Church burn to the ground. That's a common misconception that they just wanted to, to bring chaos and rain fire and destroy the church. That was not their goal. They wanted to bring reform. They wanted to bring purity into the church. They didn't, John Calvin did not want to see the church burn. He wanted to see the church burn with purification. He didn't want to see the system go down. What he wanted was to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ. They loved the church. And that's, that's my challenge for us as we look at both what's happening in our world today, in our church today, and as we look back at church history, do you love the church? Do you love God's people gathered in this place? We can't see reform without love for the church. This is a huge problem in our world where more and more people are saying, I don't need to be part of a church in order to be a good Christian. I, I, the church is full of hypocrites, the church, is, the church wounded me, and so I can worship by myself just as well as I can in the church. That's not why Christ died. Christ died, didn't die, I, carefully I say this, Christ died for his church, not so individual people could go to heaven. Okay, that, that's a byproduct of a people, individual people do go to heaven, but he died because his bride... He was calling his bride out of this world, his people out of this world, and gathering them to himself. We will not see new reformation today without a love for the church. When you see a person that, that will stand up and say, I love God's church, and that's why I want to see reform, that's where we're going to see it come through. All right, church. That was fast and furious. I've almost lost my voice. So um, I, I so appreciate you being here and going through this. Uh, hopefully... Uh, the, the notes that I gave, if you need to go back and, and look at this, but this, what we're about to see with men like John Wycliffe, I, I, I was just chomping at the bits to get to him today, but when I started to study, I realized there was too much. I wanted to see how we got to Reformation before we actually walk in, but uh, John Wycliffe, one of the boldest men I've ever seen, could stand before the Pope himself and point a finger and say, you don't know the true gospel. Uh, just an amazing, amazing moment. And so um, we're going we're gonna to look into his life starting next week. But thank you so much for uh, being here and participating. Uh, be, be in prayer. Uh, my, my challenge for us is to develop a, a deeper love for God's church, to look and say, how can I, in my small corner, in my small pocket, in my small group, how can I bring reformation? How, how can these principles of reformation come to my heart and then also to our church as well? The church has never not needed reformation. It's, it's, we're always in, in need of repentance and a renewed desire to stand on the sufficiency of God's word. So that's what we're going to be kind of focusing on. Let me pray. Father, I love you, Lord, and I thank you so much for the history of the church. 
I thank you so much that we can look back and see your provident hand in the lives of men like Martin Luther and Calvin and Knox and, and Wycliffe. Lord, you were, you were so good and gracious to a church that had largely turned their backs on you. I'm, I'm so grateful over and over and over in history and in my life that you have not abandoned us. That you, you're faithful to us. You're faithful to the covenant that you made. Lord, I, I pray that we would have that same fervent love for your bride, for the church that you do. Give us a, a heart of passion to, Lord, reform your church and reach out to bring more people into your house. Thank you for men like Josiah in the Old Testament who, who just give us, uh, Lord, so much courage and, and his story is just so powerful looking at what a, what a young man and what a young boy can do when he's fully submitted and willing. Father, I, I love you and I'm so grateful for the, the group of people here today. Bless them, Lord, for their faithfulness. Uh, there's a million other things they could be doing, but they're in your house studying your word. And I pray that you bless them this evening, Lord. Thank you, Father, for everything you do for us. Thank you for uh, adopting us in Christ Jesus to be your sons and daughters. We owe you a debt we could never repay. And so we praise you tonight. We worship you. We, we love you, Lord. We pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus.